Hi, welcome back. It's been only about a day since I valued Aramco, but there are a few issues related to the company that I think I might want to revisit here. If you remember in my post just a couple of days ago, I valued Aramco at about 1.65 trillion and I valued based on dividends, free cash for equity, free cash for the firm, and I got a remarkably tight range about around 1.65 trillion. And in that post, after I finished my valuation, I mentioned that that value does not incorporate the concerns you might have about a regime change, that the House of Saud might not be in control of Saudi Arabia in the future and the consequences for you as an investor. And I said this would lead you to discount the value, but that comment seems to have been lost somewhere in the wind, partly because I made it at the end of my valuation and also because the adjustment I made where I said I'd probably end up with a value closer to 1.5 trillion seemed completely arbitrary. But this is an issue, the issue of regime change and how it affects valuation, that's central. It's central not just in Aramco, but in many Latin American companies and increasingly in countries we're concerned about who will be running the country in the future. So I thought this would be a good time to talk about risks like regime change, how do they show up in valuation and how that might affect the value of a company like Aramco. So let's go back and think about risk. Risk shows up in so many different ways that when we think about risk, we've got to be careful about what kind of risk we're talking about. In fact, modern finance was, was created by drawing a dividing line between risk that you cannot diversify by and risk that you can. In fact, the Markowitz revolution essentially was built around the theme that the risk of an investment is the risk that it adds to a portfolio, and hence was born the CAPM and all of the other risk and return models in finance, and risk that you can diversify away. So effectively, as a diversified investor, you don't care. I'm not going to revisit that divide, but I'm going to introduce a fresh divide. The risk in an investment can be either going concern risk or truncation risk. Let me, let me explain. When we think about doing a discounted cash flow valuation, essentially we're going back to a first principle of intrinsic value, that the value of a business is the present value of the expected cash flows in the business. So discounted cash flow valuation, a tool we've kind of finessed and, and, and kind of put flesh on over the last six, seven decades as our tools have improved, essentially says that the value of a business is the present value of the expected cash flows in the business. So if you think about the equation, if the expected cash flows in the numerator, you adjust for risk in the discount rate, the present value gives you the value of, a, of an asset. Now, if you have a go of your publicly traded company, we often extend the life to go on forever, a perpetuity, and we take the value of the company as the present value, the expected cash flows forever. The way we deal with the fact that we can't estimate cash flows forever is we assume that at some point in time in the future, if cash flow is growing at a constant rate, a perpetuity, and we put closure on this. But in doing all of this, there are a couple of things we need to keep in mind. First is, this kind of cash flow valuation models are far more adaptable than most people give them credit for. I mean, I, as you probably know from reading my post, I've used discounted cash flow valuation to value young companies, startups, declining companies, distressed companies. Essentially, there's nothing that says you can use only discounted cash flow valuation only if you have a money-making company where you know a lot about the company. That said, though, there is one significant missing ingredient in DCFs or one significant limitation of a discounted cash flow model. In a discounted cash flow model, you're valuing a company as a going concern company that might have its ups and downs but keeps going. So when you estimate cash flows, the cash flows can be negative but you assume you will eventually get to positive cash flows. When you assume discount rates, you're saying there might be ups and downs but we'll continue, we'll survive as companies. So if you're valuing a going concern, a discounted cash flow valuation captures the value. But there is a risk you're not capturing in discounted cash flow value and that's truncation risk. The easiest way of, of describing what truncation risk is, is in a traditional discounted cash flow model. The way to think about risk, going concerned risk, is when you look at a year three cash flow that you've estimated, the worry you have is maybe my actual cash flows will be different. Maybe my year three cash flows are wrong. That's going concerned risk. You know what truncation risk is? Maybe there will be no year three. If your company doesn't make it to year three, you're not, never going to get to those cash flows. That is truncation risk, and that truncation risk is not captured in a discounted cash flow valuation. Here are some examples of truncation risk. If you have a young company, one of the biggest worries is the company will not make it. After all, two-thirds of young companies don't make it. 
That's survival risk. That's not captured in a DCF. If you're valuing a company at the other end of the life cycle, a declining company with a lot of debt, what you worry about is distress risk that it might be able to, unable to make its contractual payments, its debt payments, and be put out of its misery, liquidation. Those risks are not captured in a discounted cash flow valuation model. Similarly, if you look at political risk, one of the things you worry about is regime changes and the consequences. Let's take an extreme scenario. The regime changes and a new government comes in and nationalizes your company, the company that you've invested in, either paying you nothing or well below fair value. That's a truncation risk. That risk, again, is risk that's not easily captured in a DCF model. That doesn't mean people don't try. In fact, I've seen two approaches that analysts use for dealing with truncation risk. The first is to hike up the discount rate. I've often described the discount rate as the receptacle analysts have for all their fears and hopes. So when they start to get nervous, they push up the discount rate. You see this, in fact, with VCs valuing young startups. What do they do? They push up the rate. They call it a target rate, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent. It's not uncommon to see VCs claim that their discount rate is 60 percent. That is absolute nonsense. In fact, we know it's fiction. We know, you, you know how we know it's fiction? You look at the actual returns that VCs make. It's closer to 14 or 15 percent. It's not 60 percent. So you know that this is actually not a discount rate, that they're hiking up the rate to capture the fact that many of the companies they don't invest in will not make it. So discount rates I describe as blunt instruments. They were never designed for truncation risk and trying to push it in there is not going to give you a fair value. The other approach people take is they do what's called scenario analysis. Usually, really, here's a good scenario, here's a bad scenario. Nothing wrong with this, but they value the companies under different scenarios and they leave them as is. Often what they give you is a valuation range from very low to very high, completely useful, useless for decision making. For instance, with Aramco, you see ranges between 1.2 trillion and 2.5 trillion. In fact, a lot of good that does me if my judgment call is, should I be buying Aramco at a $1.7 billion pricing? So I don't like hiking up discount rates. I don't think that's what they were supposed that they were designed to do. And I don't think giving a range of values so large that they, they become useless helps me either. So here's my return. I'm borrowing from my statistics slash operations research class, a technique that I thought was interesting then, but I think is much more useful now. It's a decision tree. In a decision tree, here's what you do. You do something similar to a scenario analysis, but those scenarios that you come up with have to include all the possible outcomes. So you can't just take you know, really good average and really bad. You've got to come up with scenarios that cover the outcomes. You estimate the values under the different outcomes, and then you take an expected value. But to do this, you've, you've got to attach probability. So what makes a decision tree approach more rigorous than a scenario approach is scenarios have to cover the spectrum and you attach probabilities to each scenario. You take an expected value. In the context of Aramco, let's see how this will play out. If you remember my Aramco valuations, my dividend discount model value, my free cash flow equity value, and my free cash flow the firm value, I projected out cash flows assuming the status quo, that the House of Saud continues to rule Saudi Arabia and the oil continues to flow out of the ground. And I discounted at a discount rate that reflects that expectation. Some of you pushed back when you looked at my dis when you looked at my valuation, saying my discount rate looked too low, and it did, right? When you think about my dividend discount model, I used to discount rate a cost of equity of 4.92%. That's really not a cost of equity. I said think of it as a cost of debt because you're basically getting these dividends with a fair degree of certainty. And even in my regular cash flow models, my cost of equity was only 8.15%. In fact, to estimate my cost of equity, I incorporated a an equity risk premium for Saudi Arabia of 6.23%. Adding a 79 basis point or 0.79% country risk premium for Saudi Arabia to my base premium for the US of 5.44%. And naturally, many of you push back saying, hey, there's a lot of risk in Saudi Arabia. How come your risk premium is so low? Your cost of equity is so low? And here's what I would respond with. Much of the risk you're thinking about there then, and so I agree with you, Saudi Arabia is much riskier than the 6.23% indicates, but much of the risk you're worried about is risk that is political risk, risk that the regime will change. And you know what? This discounted cash flow valuation is a going concern value assuming the status quo. You're saying that is so unrealistic. 
You're right, if I stop right there. To bring in regime change, I need to bring in two other numbers. The first is the probability that there will be regime change, right? What will cause the House of Saud to be displaced? And the second is what will be the effect on the value of Aramco if this happens? What will that new regime do to royalties and taxes and to my equity ownership? I mean, let's think about the two extreme possibilities here. The first is that you think regime change is both imminent and overnight. That basically it's going to happen and it's pretty much guaranteed. So there's a 100% probability of change. And that if it happens, they're going to expropriate your equity. They're going to nationalize your equity. In this case, I'm going to attach a 100% probability, probability to regime change, attach a zero value to my equity under that scenario. And my expected value of equity then would be zero. Even though I get a $1.65 trillion value, in my base case, my value would be zero. At the other extreme, let's assume that you don't think regime change is ever coming to Saudi Arabia, or if it does, came, does come, that the new regime will not want to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. After all, with Thad Aramco, where does Saudi Arabia get its cash flows? It'll leave everything unchanged. If this is the case, you can stay with $1.65 trillion. So if you believe that change is imminent and guaranteed and your equity is going to go to zero, then the value of equity is zero. Otherwise, it's 1.65 trillion. The reality is or the truth is somewhere in the middle. In fact, I'm going to make a judgment call here and don't ask me to prove this because it's a judgment call that there is a chance of change that it's fairly low for Saudi Arabia, 20%. And that if change comes, the, they were, the, the new regime we might revisit the royalty rates and the tax rates and perhaps extract more cash flows from the company. In this case, let's assume that they, you get half the cash flows with this new regime in place. My expected value then will be 80% times 1.65 trillion plus 20% times 0.825 trillion, half the value. My expected value is about 1.5 trillion or a little less than 1.5 trillion, 1.485 trillion. That is where I would leave the value of Aramco. Now, obviously, you will disagree with me. You should disagree with me because I'm making a political judgment, not an economic judgment. And I, but you have to be clear about why you're disagreeing with me. If you disagree with me on the Aramco value, it's not because you disagree with my cash flows and discount rates. It's because you disagree about the likelihood of, a, of regime change and what it will do to the company. We have to be clear about our disagreements to have a decent debate. Finally, let me take a tangent here. I've always wondered about whether it's better to run a business in a democracy or an autocracy. Each brings its pluses and minuses, right? Democracies are messy. Messy because governments change, policies change, voters change their minds. In a democracy, you can never offer a business an ironclad guarantee about the future because you're not going to be in charge in the future. Not only do the changes you promise businesses have to go through legislatures, they can be checked by, by legal institutions, the courts can stop you, and ultimately the voters can vote you out. So in democracies, things will... So when you look at companies in the democracies that take projects in democracies, what do they do? They complain. They complain about the fact that things keep changing all the time, that the rules keep getting rewritten. Get used to it. It's a feature, not a bug in democracies. Here's the alternative. You can have an autocracy. An autocrat can promise things and deliver on them because he doesn't or she doesn't have or it, if it's a, if it's a group of autocrats, does not have to get it through a legislature. Or if you have a legislature, it's a rubber step. Courts are not going to stop you in an autocracy. And finally, there is no vote of judgment. They don't have to poll test something before they do it. So for, for businesses, this is often better. The rules are, are set, the tax rates are constant, the regulations don't change. So there are many companies that prefer to operate in autocracies than democracies. But here's the catch. When change comes in an autocracy, it is almost never you know, small change. It's big change. And it's often painful. So here's the trade-off. Democracies create more going concern risks. So if you think about a discounted cash flow valuation, the discount rate for a project in a democracy will probably be higher than the discount rate for the exact same project in autocracy. But the post-value adjustments you got to make for, for, these, for these discontinuous changes, truncation risk, will be greater in autocracy.
And the net effect is what you can look at as your effective value. So if you look at the risk trade-off, the going concern risk is great in a democracy, but even in a democracy, how much risk is added on will depend on how the democracy is structured and run. If you have a democracy where you have a fair degree of, of smoothness in transitions, where the two parties, even though they're opposing parties, agree on the fundamental principles of how the economy should be run and disagree at the margins, you're going to have a lot less going concern risk. One of the advantages of operating a business in the United States in the second half of the last century is the Republicans and the Democrats, two parties on either side of the spectrum, but they agreed on 80% of how the economy should be run. They might have disagreed. One, one party might have said you need higher tax rates on business and the other lower tax rates, but there was no fundamental disagreement about the basic structure of how the economy should be run. So. The, the going concern risk tended to be small. In contrast, if you have a democracy where the two, the two competing parties or maybe 10 competing parties are very different visions of the future. They operate coalitions and depending on the coalition in power, you can have a very different vision on how the entire economy should be run. You're going to get much more wrenching changes in policies, regulations and tax rates and a much bigger going concern risk. Not all democracies are equally safe or equally risky. At the, at the other end, when you look at autocracies, the risk, the, the regime change risk in an autocracy is probably greater when you have an individual autocrat than when you have an institutional autocracy. Individuals are more likely to bring more discontinuous change. They're more likely to be transitioned out. Whereas an autocracy built around ideology or a party is more likely to be gradual. Though there are exceptions. Transitions are also more likely to be violent if you have the military involved in either side of, of the change. And once you have violent change, you increase the likelihood of more violent changes down the road because people remember the losing side on a violent regime change often becomes the winning side in the next one and they bring the violence around when they come back to power. So if you ask me, is a business going to be more value? If you ask me, would you prefer to live in a democracy or autocracy? There's no contest. I'd prefer to live in a democracy. If you told me whether a business would be more valuable, if you ask me whether a business would be more valuable in a democracy or an autocracy, I can't answer the question until you tell me more about what kind of democracy and what kind of autocracy. I'm not a political scientist. I don't aim to tell you that one is better than the other, but from a valuation perspective, that's how it would play out. So here's the bottom line. I've often described valuation as a crap. What does it mean? You never quite master it. You keep the door open to change and you keep trying to learn. I'm glad I valued Aramco, very different from the IPOs of this year. I'm glad I valued Aramco because it forced me to deal with this issue of political risk. Aramco is a very easy company to value if you think about cash flows, growth and risk in traditional metrics. But I have to worry about political risk and I'm glad I did because the techniques, the tools I develop with Aramco will stand me in good stead if I'm valuing a Bolivian company, an Ecuadorian company, a Guatemalan company. After all, Latin America is now going through another phase of discontinuous change. But it's not just Latin America. I mean, you, we talked about democracies being stable or unstable. I think increasingly developed market economies are starting to look like emerging market economies. We're approaching an election in the UK where the opposing parties are far more divided than UK opposing parties used to be 20, 30, 50 years ago. In the US in 2020, you could argue, you might have an election between Republicans and Democrats divided more than they ever were in previous decades. What does that mean? It means higher discount rates, higher equity risk premiums in, in developed markets. We'll see how this plays out, but I'm glad we had this conversation. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this talk.